Um, so I'm Sergio Espania, I'm based in Baltimore, Maryland, and I'm uh, one of the statewide organizers for Healthcare as a Human Right Maryland, uh, which is yeah, a campaign directly inspired by folks in Vermont that we did in partner we launched a partnership with United Workers, Healthcare Now, and PNHP Maryland. I'm Mary Garish, I'm from Vermont, I'm president of the Vermont Workers Center. I'm originally from Michigan. <laughs> and I am a retired human rights attorney and I volunteer at the Workers Center in the Healthcare as a Human Right and with People First Campaigns. I'm Jennifer Gunn, the statewide healthcare organizer for Maine People's Alliance. Um, and we are working with partners um, the AFLCO and the Maine State Nurses Association on a healthcare as a human rights campaign in Maine following the footsteps of the Vermont. I'm James Haslam. I am the, the executive director of the Vermont Workers Center. I've been um, a part of the Workers Center and on staff uh, since uh, 1999. Um, and uh, really happy to, to be here with all of you. And in the background, you will see a slideshow that we'll keep on repeating. So, so what I was going to say is that all of the, all of the groups here representing the healthcare and human rights campaigns are all um, working not just on healthcare. Um, we're all working on issues that are uh, much broader that really relate to wanting to affect broader um, structural change on issues other than healthcare, and that is really important to us. And what we see is that um, the market-based healthcare system is really sort of a textbook example of what's wrong with our economic and political system more broadly, and that healthcare campaigns are really a vehicle for affecting some broader um, social change um, especially through uniting constituencies, through envisioning alternatives to the present um, you know, system that um, commodifies not just healthcare but also um, other public goods. And so we're using healthcare as a lever for a broader vision of, of structural change in society. And so what we'll talk about tonight, I just want to lay out the, the format of what we're trying to do, is we'll discuss a bit the, the model that um, the Healthcare as a Human Rights Campaign in Vermont has developed, um, because they've had a successful campaign winning the country's first um, universal publicly financed healthcare law in 2011. So we'll talk a little bit about um, lessons shared from Vermont. Then we'll hear about the new campaigns in Maine and in Maryland. And, um, and that will hopefully you know, inspire um, some of you to join the movement to think about what to do in your states as we've already heard from Washington, maybe Michigan will follow. Um, and so there's, um, there's clearly you know, our intention to reach out to, to groups um, beyond the states that are represented here. And um, James will then, after each state has sort of given an overview, James will sort of say more about how we can all contribute to building a national movement, a movement that will um, also uh, support Vermont in really implementing the law that was um, adopted. Um, so, and then we'll we'll have sort of a moderated discussion. I have you know a couple of questions for each panelist that I would ask them to, to address in just a minute or two, and then uh, obviously you you should be doing the same. So, um, I want to as by by way of introduction, I want to say a few words about what we were thinking when we put together the panel and the title of the panel. So it's called um, The Domino Effect, Growing um, the Healthcare as a Human Right Movement One State After Another. And so what do we mean by the domino effect? Clearly what we mean is it starts somewhere and then it cascades out from there. So we, we have this, this, um, this experience that if you um, pilot um, a, a social change initiative uh, in one location, that can be a state, but in issue, on issues other than healthcare, it could also be a city. Um, uh, then you can you can sort of set up a laboratory under favorable conditions and develop a model, or you know, as the Vermont Workers Center calls it, a, a recipe with certain ingredients, and test how that will work. And if you can make it work in a location that is presumably a favorable location, then it'll be easier to. Um, to replicate and transfer that to other states. So it entails that in a location where you feel like um, it is possible to, to um, win a victory, you can, you can model um, how, what that would look, look, would look like. Because it is important for all of us to actually have, have some kind of sense of that a policy victory is possible, that you can change what's politi politically possible in one location and then uh, inspire the replication um, of this effort somewhere else. As, 
as many of you will be aware, that that is largely how you know the right wing works in our country. That is how how Allied works um, by drawing up model uh, model bills and moving them from the states that they feel can be a laboratory, such as um, Arizona or Alabama or Florida, and then moving them into other states. And so there's no reason why we can't think of state like Vermont as having a similar role, and then following on from that, um, build a national network that can um, catalyze a more national movement. And so um, the idea behind um, behind the healthcare, achieving healthcare at the state level, is obviously to some extent influenced by what happened in Canada, how the Canadian system developed with one, starting in one province, Saskatchewan, and then moving from there. And once a critical mass of states um, uh, develops, then that can lead to federal policy change. So in this case, the issue we're using is healthcare, and there's specific reasons for that. But we wouldn't be doing this in a way that could actually help us build a national movement if we wouldn't also um, employ a broader perspective. If we wouldn't uh, also try to understand how healthcare is linked to the other um, fundamental human needs that we're dealing with and that people are currently struggling to meet, such as housing and education and work with dignity and food. So these issues are all interrelated. and. Um, uh, and we see healthcare as a particularly good lever to get started, but we're also always talking about the other issues. Um, so as I said, and we, we'll start with the reflecting a bit on the, um, the movement in Vermont, which is sort of the, the first um, stone in the domino set that we have. And so we now have, as I said, in Vermont, um, uh, a law for a universal public finance health care system, which is to be implemented by 2017, and we have a commitment in the law to provide health care as a public good. And we also have, with the Health Care as a Human Rights uh, campaign expanding into, um, and Mary and James will talk more about that, into a Put People First campaign, we have really uh, a, a very solid movement for economic and social rights more generally. And the um, the way that I would describe that sort of as a model that has been piloted in that one state is to really um, to look at um, how um, how we use the human rights frame and how we use um, grassroots organizing as sort of the unique elements of this model. So uh, my understanding is that the Health Kids Human Rights Campaign really starts by um, identifying people's needs and then elevating um, people's voices as voices of the crisis of unmet needs. So there's a, a direct sort of start with the people that are most most impacted by, um, for example, uh, lack of access to health care. And then um, encouraging people to claim, um, to claim their rights. So understand that their rights arise out of those unmet needs. And then recognize that this is tied to government obligation to meet those needs and to respect those rights. So that's sort of a, a, a relationship that I feel we will touch more upon, more upon today. Um, but that is a connection between needs, rights, and government obligation that is quite crucial to a human rights um, uh, influence or inspired campaign. And that also helps to put people at the center of the struggle. So you're supporting people as active agents, as actors in affecting um, change and in achieving those concrete policy wins. And, and at the same time, you're not just doing that with a few selected individuals or experts, but you're doing it across the board. You're building a broad base of people involved. You're building unity across different groups of people, across constituencies and across issues. So that's, again, why we always insist that it's not just health care, it's other issues as well. Because that is that unity is what you will need to really um, affect a, a change in power relations, which is ultimately what we're talking about. Um, so, so we now see that after that victory in Vermont, um, the, the push to go beyond these um, insurance um, reforms that are really, you know, a continuation of the market-based private for-profit insurance system, the push to go beyond that, uh, you know, what we now call Obamacare, is really gaining steam across the country. And we'll hear from Maryland and from Maine today, um, because they are, they're in the newest campaigns emerging that really model themselves after sort of that healthcare as a human right um, approach. And, and again, the way I see these campaigns emerging is you know, with a with a certain set of um, of set of uh, 
uh, strategic uh, interventions that, um, that starts with um, a human rights frame uh, that, that puts people at the center um, of, of the movement, um, that reaches out to new constituencies and, and grows the base and does that statewide. Um, a, a campaign that builds and sustains collective engagement from all people and that then is able to build unity and align different parts um, of, of, our, of all, all our communities. And um, this, this includes a, a focus on um, really raising awareness of how the current healthcare system works, but also how the current economic and political system works. So there's a consciousness um, building effort involved. It's raising people's expectations um, what, what they can expect from government and um, how they can expect to see their <coughs> needs met. So that also then means you advocate for policies grounded in those values, grounded in people's engagements and grounded in <coughs> principles. And, um, and, and ultimately this, this, this will um, help you um, change power relations to, to affect change. And, um, and all of this is is, you know, you can do it on that one issue of healthcare, but you'll do it in a way that connects the other issues to healthcare so that you pull in as many people as possible. And so I, I want to end with just sort of my, my own remarks on what, why I think that healthcare is a, is a pretty unique and pretty powerful lever for um, affecting that kind of structural change. And so, so the, the way the demand for universal health care usually starts out is really by emphasizing the fairly simple principle of universality. We should all have, have it. We should all have health care. We should all be um, part of a system that meets our needs. And so that, that, that very simple message is actually um, you know, quite visionary in that it is hard, it is, it is quite easy to imagine how that would look like in health care, but it's harder to imagine and some of, on some of the other issues. So it's an easy way in to talk about what would it look like if we lived in a society where everybody's needs were met. So that, for example, allows you to intervene in the welfare debate. It allows you to think about the role of government differently. So it's, it really is sort of an in for you know, starting, starting debates in a different way. So um, it also um, it leads to a structural analysis of what is really the problem. Why is healthcare not working? It's not just a matter of this is a broken system and we need to tinker with it and then it can be some reforms. There's really you know, something fundamentally wrong with it and, and we get to immediately when we speak about healthcare as a right to see well what's the opposite of that? The opposite is what we have now which is healthcare as a commodity, which is the commodification of something that should really be provided to us as a public good. And so that allows us to identify the market-based economic system as part of the root causes um, of this crisis, of the crisis of the denial of human rights. And so once you get to that, you'll come to a, a solution that really sees healthcare, but also uh, a lot of these other economic and social rights that I spoke about, as, such as food and housing, as public goods, not as commodities. So you change the way that, um, that these services are being provided to us by society and in, in society. So that leads to, um, to a different notion of how you, how you approach access to these public goods. It's the notion of um, that, uh, that we need to have equitable access to these public goods. So there's, a, you know, in healthcare, very clearly, we want equity and access to get in here, and we want equity in the way that we finance the healthcare system so that those who can, who can uh, pay more will pay more um, through taxes. And those who cannot pay at all don't have to pay at all, but you don't pay anything at the point of service. At the point of service, healthcare will be free. So that's a, a notion of equity is sort of we all um, give what we can and we get what we need. That, that is essentially very radical because it leads to, um, to this understanding of how power and resources are distributed in our society and that we need a redistribution of that. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, how I understand sort of as part of an economic crash course, how healthcare leads us actually to much, much bigger issues and why I like to think of healthcare as a lever, as an in to tackle issues that are harder to conceive and harder to build a bit vision around. But healthcare is, is a way that you, know, you can really pull people in and can achieve some tangible policy victories. And so now I want to, to hear you know, how you all have done it, are doing it. 
how did we win this inspiring victory in, Demo in Vermont, which I actually have to tell you, uh, and I've been active in civil rights and other things since I was a teenager, but this was actually the best example and the most inspiring example of democracy at work that I've been privileged to be a part of. And the reason that happened is because it was the people of Vermont that did this. It was not me or James or a committee from the Workers' Center that wrote legislation and lobbied hard to get it passed. It was the people that came together and empowered each other to let their voices be heard. Folks who, I, like my neighbor, who isn't able to read, she would never have gone to a meeting or a public forum with our legislators and even dreamed of attending, let alone said anything. But when she has other people standing with her, she feels empowered and she feels like she is a human being with dignity. And so that's why I want to say that the Healthcare is a Human Right campaign for me and, and for other issues as well. It's absolutely crucial that we did use and have used and are continuing to use five principles that every county in our state has an organizing committee. Every organizing committee agrees on those same five principles. So you can go from one end of the state to the other, there's not any debate about it. And the first one is universality, which Anya addressed somewhat. And universality means that not only that everybody gets access to medical care without barriers, but it means every human being has a right to health care, not health insurance, because health insurance has nothing to do with health care, but every human being has a right to health care. And that in and of itself sets up what I feel is a really successful model because first of all, you're talking about humanity and you're looking at each other and seeing each other's faces and knowing that you're living beings with needs and feelings that can hurt and feel pain. And almost anybody, I don't care who they are, is going to, when they listen to someone telling their story and looking them in the eyes, it doesn't matter if one of them is, has five degrees and one of them never went to school because there's that human connection there. And so those things, they try and divide us, all the powers that be, by saying, well, you know, if you get this, so-and-so isn't getting that. And, uh, and so you should really not, you know, work for them. You need to work for yourself. So when you talk about all people having health care, that might mean nobody gets it. That is such a myth because actually, if one of us doesn't have the health care we need, I don't think any of the others of us can be happy with what health care we do have. And so we need to stand together as people across religious boundaries, across ethnic boundaries, across economic boundaries. So universality brings all of that in. And the second principle is equity, as Anya mentioned, and equity in terms of the way our health care is financed. It should be publicly financed, preferably through progressive taxation, um, and publicly administered, because it is a public good, just like other public goods, whether they be education or whatever, which are also being worn away at. But at any rate, so the equity thing, and also equity isn't just you get what's fair. It, it's a lot more than that because it's you get what you need. So like I may not need the same treatment that you need. So why would I want health care that says I can only get the treatment that you need? That's ridiculous. So we should each get the care that we need. So that's another aspect of equity and of course no barriers to access. And then there is participation, which is where the grassroots movement comes in. Because we all need to participate as human beings and stand together to make sure that our government, whether it's in this case a state government or hopefully ultimately our federal government, 
serves and protects our human, our fundamental human rights, which are our needs. Mm -hmm. And by participation, we can actually empower each other to tip that scale. Um, you know, when you're little, if you're like me and are mean to your brother, and I actually did this with my brother, you sit on one end of the teeter-totter and my little brother is up on the other end and he can't go anywhere and that's pretty funny. But when, when it's me down on the ground, right, to me, right, exactly. When it's me down, when it's me up in the air and it's the insurance companies and big business down on the ground, that's not funny anymore. But if I get a couple thousand people up there with me, then we might start jumping and we might start making that thing move a little. And pretty soon if we get enough people, who's going to be up in the air now? Mm -hmm. So that's why grassroots organizing, I think, was so important to the Vermont campaign. And so the next item is accountability. And that means that our government is accountable to serving our needs. They just are. That's what it says everywhere. That's what our history is. And that's what democracy is all about. We employ them. They don't employ us. So we get to hold them accountable for what they have or haven't done. And if enough of us get together, we can actually do that. And that's why I was so inspired by the people in Vermont coming together to actually hold the legislators accountable and say, we elected you, and we're telling you this is what we want. We want this done. And it did get done. And then, of course, there's transparency, which means that while they're in the process of sorting all of this out through our Green Mountain Care Board, people have to know what's going on. They have to be, a, you know, shouldn't need 15 keys to unlock a box to find out where a meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board is. It should be accessible to everybody so that everybody can participate. And in fact, Act 48 does require that health, it says health care is a public good, it should be publicly financed. And it also requires transparency and public participation in what our health care is going to look like. And so for, for all of those reasons, the human rights framework, and what I'm calling the human rights framework is those five principles that we operate everything by, really works. Because once everybody is on board in a frame of mind saying, you're right, universality means everybody. There's not a question. And we had this, some of you I'm sure know this story, but we had this right towards the end of Act 48 being passed where a senator, embarrassingly enough, a senator from my district, um, co-sponsored an amendment to say that only citizens would be included in our health care. And, you know, originally, our legislators had told James and the Workers' Center that what we were trying to do wasn't politically possible. It just wouldn't work. So at this point, it's about to be passed, and they call again, and they say, you know what? If you insist on taking out the citizenship thing, the whole law is going to get scrapped. We just know it will. So all the people came together of the, uh, that were Workers' Center supporters and said, there's not really a question here. One of our main principles is universality. That means everybody who's a human being. So how can we possibly say that? And so they did not put in there that you had to be a citizen. So all of this helps us to prepare for a lot of the larger fights that Anya was referring to. Because now we're all sort of like-minded about how we, do, we can hold the government accountable. And we can accomplish things that we're told aren't politically possible. Now, we're, our work is far from done. <laughs> We've got a lot of education to do, especially about the idea that what we want is health care, not health insurance. And we have to keep on that steady course. But I think that our, every time that we hear about another state, and I've been to other states to talk about this, Every time we hear about another state thinking about health care as a human right, it's really inspiring to us because we say yes, and because we're all in it together, because we are all human beings. And so I hope that all of you will embrace the human rights framework and 
work hard for a change where we all get our needs met by our government. Thank you, Mary. Um, so I'll go next. My name is Jenny. I'm, uh, like I said a bit earlier, I'm the statewide health care organizer for Maine People's Alliance. Um, Maine People's Alliance is a statewide grassroots progressive organization. We have uh, members of our organization in every House and Senate district in the state. Um, we have a lot of members in Maine, which is 32,000. It doesn't seem like a lot for other states, but it's a lot in Maine. Um, and we are partnering right now with the Maine AFL-CIO and the Maine State Nurses Association. Um, for another go at universal health care, Maine has a long history of trying to get single payer passed. We have a bill in our legislature every single session um, for at least the last 20 years uh, trying to get single payer passed. We've come close a few times. We've, um, in the early 2000s, we had a single payer bill that turned into a compromise bill called DIRGO, which is our state motto, it means I leave. Um, but it was a subsidized program similar to what uh, the what's going to be available in the marketplaces where people were able to get um, a Non, a nonprofit product and a subsidy. So that was supposed to only go into effect for five years and then we were supposed to reassess and obviously that <laughs> reassessing never happened. Um, but we were really inspired by what happened in Vermont. Um, we have been struggling with, uh, in the single payer world, everybody gets bogged down and starts fighting with each other about what the specifics of the answer should look like. Um, and we were really inspired by what happened in Vermont because they stopped looking for what the specifics of the answer should look like and started thinking about let's come together on what the actual problem is and what the principles are we should be working towards, um, which is really inspiring to us. So in Maine, we were, we're really lucky because uh, Maine People's Alliance already exists. The Maine FL CIO is already on our side. The Maine State Nurses are great and they're really active. So we have a lot of infrastructure for grassroots organizing already in place. MPA, my organization, has six um, chapter areas. We have six organizers across the state uh, with active chapter bases of volunteers that are already working um, on a variety of issues, including uh, budget issues. We um, believe in a fair share economy where wealthy people and corporate people pay their fair share of taxes in order to avoid tax cuts. Um, we work on housing. We work on the environment. Um, we work on some worker justice issues like paid sick days. So we have uh, a broad array of volunteers who have already started thinking in this sort of world view. Um, and they've also been working on health care for a really long time. We were involved in the uh, passage of the Affordable Care Act, and, the, and we're still involved in the implementation. And we've been having conversations as an organization about we need to keep using this as a way to keep talking about health care, and we need to keep, to keep using it as a way of saying, all right, it's stopping the worst insurance practices, but it's not going to cover everyone. It's not good enough, so what's the next step forward? Um, in Maine, we are really hopeful that we could start, we could pass a bill um, towards health care as a human right in the next couple of years, depending on what happens in our political scene. Some of you may have heard of our Tea Party buffoon uh, governor, <laughs> um, who likes to say really ridiculous things and get on the Colbert show a lot. Uh, but we, we, we are traditionally a blue state. Uh, like I said, we've done a lot of work. We used to have, um, we used to be one of the leaders in health care. We used to have a lot of people covered on, under health insurance. Um, and we've always done experimental things with healthcare. Um, so the past three years have been really difficult for us. We've seen a lot of backwards momentum. Um, so in 2014, so next year, we have high hopes that we can hopefully get this guy out. Um, our, in 2012, we were able to turn our, our state house and state senate back to um, Democrat control. Um, and we're also making sure that the folks that we're getting elected aren't, aren't just anybody, any Joe Schmo with a D next to their name. They're actually like progressive. <laughs> Um, people who are who really will do something um, effective when they get up there. And we're hoping that the same will be true of the governor. Um, and I love the story that James always tells about. Um, they were in a similar situation. Their their Republican governor wasn't quite as bad as ours was, but um, when they had a governor's election, right in the midst of all this work that they were doing, they were able to change the scenes. So they had a, a large primary rate right, of Democratic candidates who were running for governor. Um, all of whom were saying single payer is not politically possible, which is something we hear all the time, even from our biggest allies. It's just not politically possible. Um, and because of the grassroots organizing that they did and the swell support that they got from all across the state, you had a couple of people competing with each other in the gubernatorial race about who was the bigger single payer supporter. Um, <laughs> and when I tell my folks and my volunteers that in my state, they get really excited because they, we can change the narrative of the governor's race next year. We can make a clear difference between who, uh, between the two candidates, and, and we hopefully won't end up in the same position we're in now. Because in Maine, 
Um, the reason we're in the position we're in now is because the vote was split between a Democrat and an Independent last time, and then the, de the Republican won with just 39% of the vote. And he's held steady at 39% favorability rating the entire time he's been in office. So that those 39% are going to vote for him again. Um, we just need to make sure that the rest of the state knows the difference between the other two candidates and knows who they should vote for. So we're hopeful that this can be really the, um, the issue. The other thing that we um, are really working on with our membership and with the single payer advocates in the state is um, we've also been battling with uh, folks who are so gung-ho about single payer that they just want to do something right now because it seems, makes so much sense. Why can't we just do it right now? Um, but the fact is that our politicians don't believe it's politically possible. So we have to change their minds around that and that is going to take time. We also have to get everyone else in the state who isn't paying attention to this issue to come together with a common, with a common understanding of what the problem is. Because I've found that if you go out and you talk to the general po population and you say the word single payer, they have no idea what you're talking to them about. But if you go out and knock on their door, or talk to them at the fair, and talk to them about what's your experience been like in our current healthcare system, everyone has a problem. Whether they have insurance, whether they have Medicaid, whether they have Medicare, whether they don't, like, Everyone has had some sort of problem with that, and that's where we can really find the commonality, and we can say, great, I've experienced a problem just like that. What you should do is come to this meeting, come to this rally, come to this whatever, or come, come knock on doors with me next time, so that we can find other people, so that we can figure out a solution to this together using those five principles from the human rights framework. Um, so we have a long-term approach. Our first, we're right now in this, that, that stage where we're just going out and knocking on doors. We have a survey. Um, that I think Maryland is using, that Vermont uses a version of, um, to just get people to have that conversation about what are we commonly experiencing. Let's get people to realize that this is not your fault. You are working in a broken system. Because that's another thing that the general public is dealing with, is that there's a lot of pressure on people saying, you should just go get a better job, you did something wrong, um, you're not working hard enough, and that's why you don't have health insurance. But we need to get people to understand that this is a systems problem. It's not your fault. We need to fix it together. Um, so we're going to be doing this through um, through at least Labor Day, and then we're hoping to start hold, putting the system on trial, holding public forums where people can get used to getting up and telling their story out loud, which is a really, really powerful thing to do. Um, and then once people have, have done, have had experience with that, then we'll hopefully win the governor's race um, in some way, shape, or form, and be able to take those stories to Augusta, our state capital, and use those stories there in public forums to get a, a real bill um, passed. Um, all right, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I'm from Maryland and with the Health Cares and Human Rights Maryland campaign, which is uh, was started by kind of a, a coalition of three organizations, uh, United Workers, uh, which is where I'm coming from, which is a human rights organization that got started by low-wage workers who organized themselves to get a living wage in Camden Yards. Uh, and then through, through that, developing this model that that's really uh, resonates with what folks at Vermont Worker Center are doing. Uh, and really speaks to what, what everyone here is talking about, about, just about building leadership development and creating a space where it isn't just telling people what to do, but it's creating a space where folks recognize that they, that they, that they are agents of change themselves and they have their own rights they should fight for. Um, and then, uh, so, so there's that organization, there's uh, Healthcare Now of Maryland, and there's Physicians for National Health Program of Maryland. Um, and so basically what, how we got started was, um, yeah, uh, we were trying to figure out um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work locally in Baltimore and figuring out how to go, how to do something across the state, because obviously it's not just like a, a city that's, a, that's affected by, you know, like uh, market-based healthcare, but really just capitalism in general. Um, and so how do we, how do we build a, a broad-based movement across the state? And we were allies with folks at the Long Worker Center and through the Poverty Initiative and Nestor and other folks, and we were, we were following what they were doing, and we we're like, oh, okay, sure, let's give that a go. Because we're losing, not just in, not just in Maryland at all, but I mean just throughout this country, we're losing. We've we've, you know, every every other week there's another article about how like the left isn't getting its stuff figured out and whatnot, and uh, and it's in part because it's 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 needlessly I isolating itself, and it's uh, it, we keep choosing these like single issues, you know, and so uh, healthcare was one that seemed like a single issue at first, but it's really not. It speaks to really everything that's going on. Um, and, and the model is really something, again, that speaks to us really deeply. I, I want to read this quote uh, that kind of gets at the spirit of what really drives us. Um, it says, uh, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and do not assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. You know, and, and that's really the part that's, that we feel has been missing with a lot of organizing around healthcare, really in general, 
of, of, of you know having folks be like, look, here's a bunch of data. You know, what else? What more do you need to know? You know, we've done every feasibility study that shows that it's doable. You know, call your person. We're good. And it, and it, just, doesn't, it, just, it just it just doesn't work that way because we, there's just a huge imbalance of power, to say the least. And and more importantly, too, is like we're we're not building uh, like a, a robust leadership. Uh, for, uh, for folks to really recognize that they can take on this stuff, it isn't just about how do you, you know, what what you, you know, what tasks should you report to and, and take on, but really, what can you come up with on your own? Um, and so, you know, this brought uh, Martha. You, you pointed this out in, this, in the single payer panel. You said how how single payer is really a modest reform when you think about it. And it really is. Like it's just like we're we're asking folks like it's still going to be you know privately delivered, you know, it, but it's, it should be publicly funded, um, you know. And so the way in which we we've, we've positioned this with uh, with healthcare is human right. Is to is to make it clear that like we need universal health care, but that's not just that's not our end goal. Like that's that's one of many rights, uh, and we start with this, you know. And, and so that that level of consciousness is what we've been developing within our chapters, uh, and then now chapters are taking on themselves. Uh, since we launched, uh, we're really new. We just launched in December. We've been kind of laying the groundwork for the you know of like half a year beforehand at least. Um, and since we launched, we have uh, chapters now in seven counties, uh, and in, in, and there's some individuals that are getting involved in a couple other counties. It's, and what this means, chapter-wise, is it's folks who meet at least, you know, we're talking about like 10 to 12 folks meeting at least every two weeks or uh, once a month, uh, and having these in-depth meetings where, uh, you know, we're going over, we, you know, it's a combination of uh, self-education and of logistical stuff. You know, we got it. We, we have to develop. We see this. We see this campaign as a school. You know, to build leaders. And so that means that people have to do work, that means people have to have dialogue, that means people have to have hard discussions with each other, that means people have to figure things out on their own. So what, how we do that is we have a space uh, at our meetings where the, you know, we, we start or end with uh, half the portion uh, focused on an education. What that means is we have these, uh, you know, these very broad units uh, around uh, power dynamics, the history of organizing in this country and abroad, um, how, what, what, is, what, is, what does it mean for something to be a human right? Uh, you know, uh, the principles which are extremely crucial for us. Um, I would actually, I, I, we're going to sound redundant, but I think that's fine because I, I, there's something to these principles and the fact that, you know, we were talking about this in the other one, like, like when a lot of folks don't know what single payer is, you know, like, or even if you say Medicare for all, sometimes it's a little too politicized, uh, you know, and folks don't really, don't, can't really connect the dots. I mean, there are a lot of folks who think that Obamacare is single payer and just like think like, oh, it's in October or something, everything's figured out. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a huge uh, misinformation uh, effort that's going on and really honestly, there's also just a huge lack of education within our, within our communities. Um, and so these principles allow us to really dig deep in, in a very nuanced way without having to rely on, you know, here's like the bed to administrator ratio or, or here's where the cuts go to, to pharmaceuticals or, you know, et cetera. Um, but you dig, but you still can, you can still speak about those and you can speak about them in a way that's, that's, that, that is where people are at, that are based on like fundamental values of universality, equity, et cetera. Um, and, and through that, we can also start laying the groundwork where we're not just taking on uh, healthcare, uh, but we start having these conversations about like, well, I mean, I mean, health, the reason why we have such a gross healthcare system is because uh, inequality and in, in the power structure right now, a huge, lo you know, lobbying, as folks mentioned, it's the largest lobby in the country. Um, it's also, you know, based on the, these huge public health issues of just their social determinants that are, that are a huge part of uh, whether your right is protected, not just about whether or not you have access to single payer, but like whether or not you have a decent job, whether or not you have decent housing, whether or not you're treated like a human being or an illegal, you know, et, et cetera. And, and we can we can delve into that without feeling like we're just trying to hop on a different issues because we're not. You know, we're using healthcare as how you know we start these, this conversation because it's it's not as as overtly you know uh, in your face political one way or another. Uh, and and that's been actually a crucial part too. You know, like we we we're not not only are we nonpartisan but we don't portray ourselves as being uh, you know like leftists. Uh, you know, uh, we have we have Republicans involved in some of our chapters. We have Democrats. We have Independents. We have anarchists, etc. Um, and uh, and we've been able to really delve deep by using this uh, this kind of human rights narrative. Um, you know, for example, in, in Calvert County a couple weeks ago, our chapter there had a had a, had a public forum on, on what human rights are and what are issues in our community. And half the room was our chapter, and the other half uh, were folks uh, from uh, libertarians and from the Tea Party. And like and like people were just like really just you know like cra throwing out some crazy points, you know. Um, and it was, it was kind of awkward at first. Um, we were, it was obvious. Yeah, but, but we were able to work through that though, because like a, like a lot of us, not just the, not just in Tea Party left, but also within us, we internalize a lot of bullet points and say that's where we stand. And then once you once you get through that stuff, you know, like you still have to justify where you come from, and you start finding out a common framework. 
Um, and so one thing that really helped click for folks is uh, we, we talked about this constant pl of plantation politics. And that's, you know, of just uh, right now, it's, it's, it's the poor fighting amongst the poor for scraps without recognizing that, you know, there's no reason why we, we, you know, we need to be not only you know, dealing with scraps, but also fighting each other. You know, so we talk about like, uh, there's this little cartoon that like clicked for me like three years ago and it's kind of brainwashed me since. Of like, there's like three dogs, there's a, there's a black dog, there's a white dog, and they're fighting over one bone. And then over there, there's this, there's a white dog with like a Mount Everest of bones just looking at them laughing, you know. And, and that's yeah. that's basically where we're at as, as a nation right now. Is we find what whatever thing is going wrong in our society, it's a result of our neighbors, you know. And and we we keep just internalizing that. And so uh, we're very we're very intentional about about challenging that uh, through this campaign. And then um, a couple other points uh, that I want to make up is um, what was it the other one? All right, the other thing too is like folks were talking about uh, in the previous panel and also within here about the importance of, of basing this off of human needs and off of our own stories. You know, uh, highlighting like the story of, you know, uh, students talking with Canadians and, and being like, whoa, didn't expect that. Uh, to folks having to deal with medical debt, et cetera. Um, and so we've been doing that within our campaign. That's really kind of our driving force as we build this. Is um, we've, uh, our, you know, and we, we see all these things as, uh, as opportunities to develop leaders in our chapters. Like so. In the first few months, we've been doing these healthcare surveys around the state, and that's given us an excuse for chapters to get experience talking to strangers, having difficult conversations, having a lot of positive ones because the majority of people are on our side. We just forget that because we don't talk to each other. Um, you know, and then um, so we do these surveys, and from there we have started you know get a list of folks around the chap around the counties that that are interested in this and that have issues, and then from there we've started having these speakouts uh, across uh, across the state. We're having. You know, so we're pretty, we're pretty new, but we're having our third one uh, in Frederick in a couple of weeks. And uh, at these speakouts, we have you know uh, folks from all over the counties come in and just share their healthcare stories, mm -hmm. having to deal with medical debt, medical bankruptcy, you know, uh, insurance only covering three treatments when they need five to live, you know, like like uh, just a wide range of insanity. Um, and and, th and this is the crucial part. It's like it's not just that we're using these stories to, to put a human face on it. It's that the, the the people in the room are are the folks who are leading this campaign. You know, that's the part. Like, it isn't just like how do we use these stories to move folks. It's a uh, how do we get the folks who are directly affected to shape this. You know, it, it's not about advocating on behalf of other people. It's about the fact that like the disenfranchised and the poor need to be at the forefront of this because they get what's going on. They, and and they're the ones that are needlessly disempowered. And once we start, you know, building that unity, which we're starting to do um, across color, across class. Um, you know, ar around the fact that that fighting for healthcare is a right addresses these broader issues and helps to build this. This, uh, this movement across the state uh, to take on our broader rights, um, that's, when, that's when something pretty, I'm hoping pretty, pretty awesome happens, where like, it clicks that, you know, that there's, there's a lot more that we gotta do for sure, but we understand that we can do it together. Um, and so it's been really inspiring getting this, uh, you know, uh, this inspiration, uh, inspiring, 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 uh, from, uh, uh, from Vermont, um, you know, but this is something that's, that hasn't just come from Vermont, or that's just come from Maryland, this is something that's, that it's universally known. We understand that's why it's called. Who's Black right. from <laughs> Yeah, uh, I haven't seen that sketch or sketch, but um, you know, like so, like yeah. So it's it's just about tapping into like it's not like here's the right ism. Everybody read this book on this ism. It's just like we're reminding ourselves that we're all human beings. And so, what does that mean when we work together? What does that mean when we build a community that's based off of meeting our needs? Um, and yeah, so that's kind of what's going on so far. Yeah, you talked about like some healthcare surveys you did. Was that, but did you use like any polling as well, like work with universities to get data on like what the overall percentage of people in the state would be in favor of like a state single payer? Obviously using language that is accessible if you would. Uh, you mean like in creating the, the survey? Yeah, I don't know if like, did you guys work with anyone to maybe do something like that? Or? Uh, yeah, we worked with some people. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, like uh, folks at Nestry have been instrumental in, in, in helping us to, to build a survey that, that, that just does ask these questions in ways that, that you know, that yeah, are, are pretty, pretty successful, but while not also being super biased, you know, like. Um, and um, but with that said, I mean, I can't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fib. Like the aim with this is like, I mean, we already know where we stand. Like the majority of the country does support universal health care. Right. Uh, the majority of Maryland, for sure. It's a, you know, we're pretty solid blue states. Um, you know, um, and not just blue, but like folks just get it. Folks have to deal with the bills. Um, you know, so so we know that that majority of people are on our side. The catch is how do we how do we reach out to another so, to one another? So the surveys are an excuse for us to do that. Um, you know, we you know we have questions about like, have you ever had to deal with? Medical debt. Uh, do you believe healthcare is a right? Do you believe the government has an obligation to protect that right? 
Would you rather support a publicly funded system over one that's got you know insurance companies in the middle? Um, it's, it's phrased a little more eloquently than that, but you know, like, um, and so and so through the surveys, you know, you kind of have like a structured excuse to have a pretty in-depth conversation with folks, um, and so it's uh, yeah, so it allows us to, to dig in with those um, and, and find potential. So it's leaders. not an opinion polling or testing tool as some of the you know whatever other political campaigns do, but it is a tool to engage with people and to, to hear from them and have these conversations. And then obviously you can and you, you will then report out what you hear. And you know Vermont has done that in 2008, 2009. They did that kind of surveying in that way and found that you know 95% of the people they surveyed believed that healthcare is a human right. That doesn't mean that we conducted a scientific poll, but it means we have a lot of people that become engaged in this and that have a stake in it and that are going to be active with us. That's what it means. So that's, that's how we, we, we all sort of use these kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. and then the moderator would have several yes or no type questions that she would ask each candidate or each legislator because this didn't happen just during election years. This happens all the time to keep people on track. And one, in this instance, the relevant one would be, do you believe health care is a human right, yes or no? For the people that said yes, that was great. And then the people in the town would be in touch with them saying, okay, what do you need from us in order to champion um, our cause and talk, to your, talk it up to your other legislators? The people that said no, their constituents were notified that they had said no, so that their constituents could say, what are you thinking? And keep harassing them about it and say, you know, I may have voted for you last time, but hey, get a grip. So I think the public forums were one very very useful method of accountability. Does that answer the question? Does it? One more question, if there is any. Oh, there yeah. Is. yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you make the difference between health care and health insurance? Yeah, I would, I would love to do that because it's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> I, I came from a family of parents who were both in the medical profession and um, who said nobody should ever be deprived of health care because they can't afford it. And yet, half the time the insurance didn't pay for what patients mm -hmm. needed, so they wound up getting the care anyway because 
my dad believed in socialized medicine, but um, so health care is a whole spectrum of needs that we have to stay healthy. And when we talk about it in a clinical or a you know a medical setting, we're talking about um, it could be nutrition, it could be acupuncture, it could be any other kind of alternative medical, it could be Reiki, any of those things. And it's what you need to not only <coughs> maintain your maximum health so that you can live your life to the fullest, but to, if you have some chronic illness, to be able to access whatever you need to manage that illness and still live an independent life. Whereas health insurance is something that I pay for. They hope I don't ever use it because that's the only time they make money. I, the only things that are gonna that they're gonna help me pay for are this little box of listed items. And if acupuncture isn't in there, forget it. I'm not getting any help paying for that. And it doesn't matter if I, and we've seen people who need transplants who can't get them, who, the insurance company won't pay because, well, they're probably gonna die anyway. You know, mm -hmm. that's not healthcare. So health insurance is what we've all grown up with thinking, oh gee, is it covered? Can I, can I do it? So the paradigm shift is between that mentality of a benefits package and just getting the care you need. It's just, you know, a totally different perspective on things. I, does that help anyone? Yes. James, over to you. Okay. Um, before I forget, did everyone get a chance to sign in on the Health Care Human Rights Campaign? Did that come around? I think it went around. Okay. Cool. Um, well, I just have to first say that, you know, it's just such uh, an honor to be, you know, with uh, the folks here, but just with all of you and, and all the people that have gotten involved in this work, it's just, um, it's been in incredible to see, you know, that, you know, as, as we, we, we went around in the early days of this and, you know, started raising expectations about what was possible, and just to see the momentum that's been built, the, the things that we've accomplished, and and the, the fact that, you know, as we used... Um, this way of talking about healthcare as a human right, as as people's experiences, and really putting people at the center of the struggle, uh, it's just been incredibly uh, powerful to see people who, you know, for the first time that they ever spoke out publicly uh, about their very personal situation with healthcare, and, and and telling the story that you know, in some way, there was a lot of guilt and sh shame that somehow they failed their themselves or their family tell that story and then see their neighbors say a very similar story you know and and then you know see that the power that that had on people's communities and ultimately in changing what was politically possible but looking back five years later now seeing those people uh, that are now leaders of, of a movement and have seen something that was like uh, something that they were struggling with and, and really thought it was just a, a something that could never be changed to be now something that, that that has been changed, and that we are changing, and that they were part of that, uh, and uh, it's just been an incredibly powerful thing to be able to be part of and to, to see happen. And um, you know, the the Vermont Workers Center back in uh, when we started in 1998, you know, we we had a big broad mission around like the rights of working people, and you know what what that would mean around housing and education and child care and a healthy environment and, and all of these kind of things and then we you know started trying to do some of that work and focusing a lot on workers rights and livable wages and from the very beginning we supported single payer health care and after you know the first 10 years of trying doing some really righteous work you know having some good workplace victories winning livable wage policies in different areas we just saw it as a situation where the cards were stacked against us you know that the, the, the environment that we were organizing with, the playing field that you know that our communities had to play on to try to get their rights, was just completely one-sided, and that we needed to try to change that landscape. And so, after you know many many uh, conversations with our members and our communities, we saw healthcare as an issue that was a crisis in our communities affected everybody, and we thought we could get our communities organized around 
in a way that not only we could change what was politically possible and win, but we could be, get permanently organized so that we could implement that system and then starting to fight for the other rights that our communities uh, were also not at. It. So, uh, so that was in 2008. And, um, you know, we had, like I said, we've been part of the single payer movement. We, we felt very strongly that that, that made a lot of sense. Uh, but we also were able to sort of be a, a part of that to see, you know, where some of the, the things that were very difficult about it. Um, that, you know, that, that in terms of where it was kind of like hitting a wall. And, you know, and it was a, you know, a, a very similar situation we, we see in other areas where, you know, obviously the, the facts are on our side in many of these things. You know, that, that of course, there's all, you know, you go across this conference and, you know, the things that we're fighting for, you know, like, you know, not ecological disaster. I mean, they, 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 the facts are on our side. It's, it really becomes a question of power. And can we have enough power in our communities to change things that make a whole lot more sense for everybody? And so uh, and, and when we started the, this, this campaign, we realized that, you know, that we were not going to, it was not about passing like a, a piece of legislation. Because, you know, there was going to need to be, you know, as we started getting into it and we realized this, We've, you know, we've passed several pieces of legislation now. One really big one, another like pretty big one, and then a whole bunch of other little ones. And, and we're going to need to pass more legislation. And now we have a whole new body that's been formed, this Green Mountain Care Board, which is, you know, we're trying to hold accountable to make sure it fulfills the law that was passed in 2011 all the way up until 2017. So it wasn't, we, you know, it's not really about the policy. It's really about the power. It's around like, the power in our communities to be able to hold elected officials accountable, to follow through with laws that get passed and make sure that they pass the new laws that need to be passed. So, uh, you know, as we have been engaged in this effort, you know, we've seen the tunes change of many of these elected officials. You know, as Jenny mentioned, you know, when we first sat down with our state senator, Peter Shumlin, he was not, he didn't think Vermont could do this. And then, you know, when he started thinking about running for governor, he was like a little bit more open-minded, but he was the pro tem of the Senate, so he's a little reluctant to give any promises. But then when he saw, you know, all of these people coming out, and he saw that maybe some of these other people that wanted to be governor start championing, uh, you know, this, this bill that we wanted to get picked up, then he was like, well, I'm going to be the bigger champion of it. <laughs> and so, you know, by the time he was running for governor, his, his uh, you know, campaign speech was health care is a right, not a privilege. Vermont can lead the way and have the first universal single payer system in this country. Yeah. And so that was, you know, in the course of a couple of like 18 months. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we saw that, you know, that if we did a good job organizing, we could determine what was politically possible. You know, we, we, could, we could be the, the agents of change. We didn't have to let politicians tell us what can and can't happen. But we had to be in it for the long haul. So you know when when we passed that you know that first bill it was a, it was a breakthrough and but I, I think that you know one of the, the things that Mary mentioned that we we uh, have have made sure that we've really harvested these lessons around is because you know the human rights framework and many of the organizations the Vermont Workers Center are about more than just healthcare it's been really important because you know that victory around getting out this amendment that would have excluded undocumented. Mm -hmm. Workers, even though the Shumlin's administration told us there was a zero percent chance to get it up, when we did that, you know, you know, this was a, a, a Senate that was controlled twenty-two to eight uh, with, by Democrats that, put, that passed that amendment, in. Uh, and the, the vote was twenty-two to eight. So it should have been eight to twenty-two if they had done the right thing. And but you know that but that gives you a sense of where immigrant rights were in in Vermont at that stage. This pat like just actually a week ago. But no, it was a Tuesday. We, we, signed, we were on the, the State House steps signing a bill with our sister organization, which has sprung up basically in that two year period uh, migrant justice, passing a driver's license bill for un all undocumented workers. And that would have never happened if it wasn't for the fact that you know, the legislature got taught that the people of Vermont, you know, when organized, demanded immigrant rights, demanded that you know, universal equals everyone. And that momentum is carried on to, to future victories. And so, you know, as we think about building uh, this healthcare as a human rights movement in this country, uh, we're really talking about, you know, how can we build a human rights movement in this country for real democracy? And building, you know, a, a, a people's movement that has the power to cha challenge the immense power of corporations and the wealthy 
that uh, you know have been driving uh, this country and this this planet in in the, the wrong direction. So, um, you know, what just you know, I know we will have some time to to talk about some of this stuff. But just thinking about you know moving forward from our position, you know, we have 2013. You know, we we just passed some of these other laws. We've actually used the, the network of where people came in the door fighting around universal health care. As I said, you know, winning these undocumented uh, driver's licenses. Uh, a workers' rights bill that allows uh, 7,000 um, home care workers uh, to have collective bargaining rights uh, has been supported under this broader agenda of put people first. And so, you know, we, we've been able to, to, to make uh, a bunch of progress, but we still have some huge things to fight for. We have to get the equitable financing of this, of this health care system, which is probably going to be determined in 2015. We also have to, you know, have this sort of big transformation from, from coverage, health insurance, as we've been talking about, to actually a care system that's based on, on care. And the exciting thing for us on that is that, that you know, for both of those things, you know, we're, we're, we have to be engaging not only about these health care things, but about, you know, the bigger picture. When we're talking about financing a health care system, it's such a big number. Um, we are talking about tax policy. And when we start actually talking about health, has been you know it's been talked about. If you actually are talking about having a health care system, or you know, you're talking about you know almost all of our, our government services. I mean, health is such interconnected in so many ways interconnected. And you know we've been working with a lot of nurses and health professionals and public health folks that say when you know if you want to have people be healthy, I mean if we have a health care universal health care system, you have to care about all the social determinants. A labor. You have, to have, you have to have safe working, you know, can, you know have a, you know, uh, mm -hmm. health care be a human right and have people getting poisoned at work. Right. And you can't have, yeah, have health care be a human right and people get poisoned in their communities, you know, or not have housing, not, you know, so it's about having all of our human rights. And so, um, you know, it's just thinking forward, you know, we, 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 you know, have a couple of big years of struggle around some pretty, you know, big paradigm shifts and, and changes that we're trying to establish in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And you know, ideally, you know, 2017 rolls around, we're able to have a, a system where every single Vermonter has a uh, has green access to Green Mountain Care that's equitably financed and is you know getting all the needs that they that they uh, any anything that they they need. And we have a, a system where we have you know uh, real participation on a community level and what what our healthcare system looks like. And you know we've been basically have had to wrestle with this equitable financing and really equitable financing of our of our government. And um, right on our heels is Maine and Maryland, you know. And so you know, just thinking about like building a movement in this country. I mean, there's so many of our state local struggles and states. We've been on the defensive. You know, we've been fighting. You know, cuts to things that our grandparents fought for you know, our great-grandparents. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, in, in this case, you know, we'll be able to go on the offense, you know, win a universal health care system that we should have had a long time ago in this country, and, and, and have it be part of a, a broader movement for human rights and for real democracy in our communities. And so, you know, we have one state, you know, how, how much easier would it, will it be when, when, you know, if we get this right in Vermont and in Maine and in Maryland and in New York, in you know Pennsylvania, California, Washington, you know there's huge Michigan. movements in Michigan. So I'm the gospel of the nation, right? Yeah, but well, sure. so uh, so that's the way it should be. That's the idea, you know, that you know that we're, we'll we'll be able to, to do this. So one of the things just I wanted to lift up that we've really been trying to harvest as much as we can in Vermont and talking with folks in in Maine and Maryland and Pennsylvania and. Uh, is, is really thinking about this sort of organizing model. What does it take to get our communities organized? You know, it's not just about like sort of, you know, uh, a one-time sign a petition, tell us your story, and then we will never talk to you again. I mean, it really is about, you know, that relationship building that would, happens on a community level with our coworkers, our neighbors, our families and friends, and really the, you know, needing to, to build a transformative consciousness in our communities, you know, a lot of the thing, the reasons why these victories happened with our great grandparents, because they had a different class consciousness. They had a different. They, we didn't have. We didn't have to reteach people then about organizing. They knew organizing. They were organizing in their workplaces. They were organizing. They, 
they, uh, in, in their communities. They knew who the real opposition was. And it wasn't you know, these ways that, that our communities have been divided against each other. They knew the bankers were the problem. You know, they knew, you know, that, that, so you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, a, a long uh, relationship that we have to build with, with our communities and think about how, you know, what are the models that we can have to get organized. So you know, we mentioned this sort of recipe or ingredients, of what are the elements of that? And we've been trying to harvest it and, and be able to use it so it can be replicable all across our communities um, and, um, and, and be something that we can you know, use, use for the long haul that is based on this human rights framework. Because we see the human rights framework is a, is a great way to look at Put, you know, as has been talked about, put the system on trial, in this case, health care, that not meeting the needs, but also have a vision for what do we want. You know, and these principles are, are, are guidelines to that vision of what we can have that actually does meet the needs, where it's universal and equitable, uh, but accountable uh, and transparent so that, you know, we have the real democracy uh, necessary to make it work. Um, so, you know, that it, it's just, you know, in, in, in important to, to remember that, you know, in, in this effort that we're trying to build a movement where every single person you know can be an agent of change in that movement so uh, it's really exciting to think about um, you know when we come back maybe to a left forum in, in 2017 and, you know and, and there's you know many more states up here and there's a universal health care system we'll have to show you our, have to show you our universal health care card that we have <laughs> yeah. thank you James <laughs>